Hello and welcome to Warwick iCast. This week we'll be meeting the Warwick engineers helping to develop the cutting edge technology that goes into electric cars like this, the Toyota Prius. And we're off to the movies. We'll be asking what it is that makes us go and see a particular film. But first, electric cars. If, as the experts predict, most of us will be driving them in 20 years' time, then this material has a vital role to play. It's called silicon carbide, and it's being developed here at the School of Engineering by Professor Phil Morby. What work are you doing on this? Well, we're looking at this material for a wide range of applications. Uh, automotive is one of them, but aerospace and uh, energy distribution is another area where this material could be used. We're taking this material and we're looking at ways of turning it into uh, components that are able to switch energy uh, through these different applications. So we're looking at uh, how this can improve and, and, uh, uh, hybrid vehicle technology in particular. So what's the advantage of silicon carbide? Well, being a semiconductor that we call a wide band gap semiconductor, uh, it gives us many advantages. That wide band gap means that you can apply much higher electric fields to this material than you could to silicon without it breaking down. It also is much better at conducting heat, so any heat generated in this material will conduct away from it a lot more quickly. So that makes it much more suitable for very harsh environments like you have underneath the bonnet of a, an automotive vehicle or indeed in aerospace applications. But it's not cheap, is it? This wafer of silicon carbide costs six thousand pounds. That's true. At the moment the uh, market for this material in terms of the applications we're talking about is very small. Um, the main market which this is developed for is for um, uh, photonics, for producing blue LEDs. It also produces blue light this material and most of this material goes into that market. The power device is riding, uh, market is riding on the back of that and uh, as time goes by, it will come to dominate the market for this material. And so the prices will drop significantly. Now, Professor Morby's department is currently involved in a joint project with the Toyota Motor Corporation. It's an area that researchers at Toyota are spending a great deal of time developing. By using silicon technology, we have uh, heat dissipation and uh, losses. Uh, these are electrical losses and uh, heat losses. But uh, by using silicon carbide, uh, we can reduce. It has a possibility to reduce these losses. And that will have an uh, effect on the fuel efficiency, which will bring uh, better fuel efficiency. This is an inverter from a Toyota Prius. As you can see, it is large and heavy. Together with Professor Morby and the University of Warwick, we're trying to reduce the size of it for use in cars. We have some limitations of using the current silicon carbide technology in fitting it into motor vehicles, and we hope our three-year collaboration will help find solutions to this. Well, joining me now is Graham Roberts, who's a PhD student here in the School of Engineering. You're working on the Toyota project. What exactly are you doing? I'm developing models for silicon carbide shock diodes and MOSFETs, two of the devices which are important in this Toyota project. And what's this machine here? This machine's a high-power curve tracer, which automates the capture of DC characteristics for the devices I've mentioned. How long does the project go on for, and what are you hoping to achieve by the end of it? Well, I'm going to be studying this for the next three years of my PhD, by the end of it, I hope to have published a good number of scientific papers on the area of silicon carbide and other wide band gap semiconductors. Thank you, Graham. But, Professor Morby, there are other companies you're dealing with. There are several other companies uh, and different application areas that uh, also could benefit from the uh, properties of silicon carbide. For example, we're working with a company in rugby that make wind turbines. They could also make a uh, huge benefit from this material. Likewise, we're working with a company in the aerospace sector. Uh, obviously, they require materials which are lighter and uh, smaller for, to uh, fit into planes to, make them, uh, uh, to give them more fuel efficiency. Finally, there's a company which uh, are looking at uh, the use of silicon carbide in power distribution systems in, in the Midlands as well. Um, and as you can see, if we put all these uh, areas together, then silicon carbide has a very, very bright future indeed. 
Now, a successful movie can make hundreds of millions of pounds at the box office. Not surprising then that companies go to great lengths to persuade us to watch them. Sarah Thackeray has been talking to Chris Meir, a Warwick academic who's an expert on how films are promoted. As my research has evolved, uh, you see more and more that these kind of things like trailers and posters affect how people understand the film in the first place. So a lot of research, you'll watch a film and then think, oh, well, that's interesting that people thought this, uh, you know, like other writers. And then you look at the way the film was sold and you realize that the, you know, it's so different from how you understood the film looking back 20 years from now. So um, the whole idea of uh, you know, changing images and, and understanding a culture uh, a lot of times can be influenced like, greatly by these ancillary, what we always thought of as ancillary materials. Um, and you know you realize how influential they are when you see things like that happen. What specific marketing tools are you looking at? I mean, you mentioned trailers and posters. The work that's been done in advertising and, and promotion in film studies, uh, you know, is, is gravitated towards the trailer because they come on DVDs now. You can kind of compare a three-minute version of this <laughs> two-hour movie you just watched to what you know, to, to kind of uh, you know, because you have the tools already as a film person to to look at a, a moving text. But um, you know, there's a lot more out there that needs to be looked at. I think, and uh, press books are. Uh, for, in interest, uh, or, uh, for instance, uh, a, a pretty fascinating kind of summary of what went on during the making of a movie, or at least what they want you to know <laughs> went on during a movie. So press books are, are also kind of a key part of the research. And just uh, and when you read critical reviews of a movie, for instance, uh, you'll notice they keep coming back to the same theme across every newspaper in the spectrum. And then when you go back and read the film's press book, you realize that they've all been lifting stuff from, from the press book or taking their cues, you know. So, you know, so a film will say, you know, like, this is an, you know, a press book will say, this is an interesting part of the film. And then every reviewer will comment on that aspect of the film. And, and then when you, you know, read even academic studies of that film, 10 years later, you know, they're still talking about the same things that were in the press book originally. So those kind of things, like, really guide how we understand what we watch. What's the effect of the evolution of the internet been on movie marketing? I mean, thinking about things like YouTube and MySpace. It's gone from the trailer being, I don't know if you remember, when you'd rent a video, you'd have the trailers at the beginning and a lot of people would fast forward through them, you know, like, because you just want to get to the movie. But now you go online to, to look for, you know, trailers are an object themselves, you know, you'll, you, you go collect them or, you know, you'll go to your, your favorite website and watch all the trailers, you know, of the new movies this week. So, like something meant to advertise a commodity has become a commodity itself. Looking forward, is, it's hard to say what effect YouTube and my t MySpace and these kind of sites will have, although the media companies are paying you know, top dollar to buy these sites. So, you know, that indicates they think <laughs> you know, it's going to have a massive effect, but we'll have to see how the dust settles, uh, really. <laughs> and how have these marketing tools evolved over time with the history of cinema? A really good example of one kind of cross-cultural one, just for the British and American example, um, um, was The Crying Game. Um, it's kind of a very famous marketing campaign, you know, within the film industry and within kind of academics who study uh, Britain and Ireland, um, but for instance, it came out here. Originally, uh, the story was set in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, and uh, it came out here as kind of a gritty, realist drama about you know the human side of the Troubles. Didn't do very well at business-wise at all because you know no one wanted to see the Troubles <laughs> on screen anymore. But when it was bought for distribution in the United States, uh, the Weinstein, um, sorry, the Miramax, the Weinstein's took it and made it all about the twist, about uh, the guy you know, secretly being a man and, and turned that into the major selling point, like uh, you won't believe what happened. Can you give any specific examples of a marketing campaign that's been remarkable for, for its success? Yeah, and uh, I'd point to the crying game, but also something like Train Spotting is really well known for its success. You know, it was a, bu a film made with a very small budget by international standards. But because the merchandising, they were able to merchandise the soundtrack, its young stars, the book that was uh, it was based on, um, you know, really made it into a film with a lot of widespread appeal, and you know that made a lot of money not just in cinemas but through these different kind of outlets, you know, and so it started from nothing, and and really because of the kind of clever marketing, making the posters with all four characters, you know, doing little things, and and you know branding the book with uh, the actors on the front, it turned it into a you know a phenomenal success, you know, from Thing. How will your findings benefit future students and academics? Marketing is something that's around us all the time. 
Um, so we're, we're kind of just used to it, uh, but we, you know, we don't really understand it enough. So I think uh, you know, the more you know, DVD gives out all these uh, materials with it, you'll be a lot, you know, there'll be a lot more self-awareness about the way media companies are molding their content for you. you know? So when you sit down to see a movie, you'll think twice about, well, just because the trailer said this, maybe I should watch with an open mind before I make, you know, and then watch you know, the marketing documents after and kind of understand how you're, you know, you're being taught to look at movies a certain way, you know, and it's not just you come to it with a blank mind, you know, like everything is being pre-packaged for you before you see it. And so I'm hoping that, and I'm also hoping that, uh, you know, like the people working in the industry can apply these kind of, you know, like these techniques that they see work really well for low-budget films or no-budget films, as they call them, or alternative uh, media formats. So it's not just the big companies in mainstream films that are benefiting from these strategies and stuff that you can, you know, make a small-budget movie, you know, w known in every household, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, make a film more viable than it would have been otherwise. So those are kind of the two of the major effects I, you know, hope to come out of the research. Chris Mayer, thanks very much. Thank you. Sarah Thackeray there talking to Chris Mayer about the science behind promoting the modern movie. Well, that's it from Warwick Eyecast for this term. We'll be back after a short break. In the meantime, have a good Easter.